let's do this. Ladies and gentlemans, welcome to this video all about English and its messed up plurals. In this episode, I'll explain why there are men and women, not mans and womans, why your feet aren't your foots and your teeth aren't your tooths, why more than one deer are still just deer, and why two gooses are geese but two mooses aren't meese. They're actually just moose, aren't they? Just like two sheep. They're still sheep. I'll also help you to avoid any verbal crises with the Latin and Greek plurals we use. Indices, vortices, media, data, and other such phenomena. The only criteria to end your plural perplexitude is to watch until the end. Now, just before I get into it, I just wanted to say a big thank you to everyone who's subscribed to my channel since I posted my last video, which admittedly was a while ago, but quite a lot's happened in the intervening time, so you can maybe forgive me that. If you haven't already signed up, please do hit that subscribe button now. And while you're at it, why don't you leave a comment? Tell me about some of the weird plurals in English that you've come across, or if you know another language, the ways in which they construct their plurals. I'd love to learn more about all of this from you as well. Right, let's get into it. So in modern English, we have one nice, easy way of turning one into more than one. We just stick an S on the end, or maybe an ES if elegant pronunciation dictates it. So when a new noun comes along, we automatically actually know how to turn it into a plural. That's why we're taking Ubers, posting TikToks, and mocking millennials nowadays. So how come there are a load of words in English where the plural isn't just the same as the singular with an S slapped on the end. Well, there are lots of reasons, and I'm going to explain as many as I can. To do so, I'm going to break the plurals down into a series of categories. First up, the old-fashioned ones. An explanation of a lot of the unusual plurals in English is that they're left over from a time long past when English did have more than one way of pluralising nouns. Old English, for example, had lots of them. Yes, you could just add an S, but some words were pluralised by, for example, adding an N instead. We each only have one tonga, tong, but between the lot of us, we have many tongan, or at least we would have done in the Old English times. And your neighbour may only have one ox, or he may have a whole herd of oxen. And that is actually the only one of these Old English N plurals that has lasted through to modern English. Other Old English nouns were pluralised in a completely different way altogether, not by adding a letter, but by changing the vowel sound in the middle of the word. It's something that's going to be familiar to speakers of modern-day German. In German, the word for foot, for example, is fuss, but two feet are fusse. You hear how that vowel sound in the middle changed? Just like one hand is hand, but uh, two hands are hände. And perhaps more interesting for us, one man is ein Mann, but many men are Männer. Now, the shifting of the vowel sound is called Umlaut, which is also the name of the two dots you see in lots of German words. The fact that Old English also did this is the reason why we have words like men instead of mans, but also why we have feet instead of foots, geese instead of gooses, teeth instead of tooths, and mice instead of mouses. They've all just changed that vowel sound in the middle to become a plural. Now, another set of plurals that can be put down to English practices long past are these, children and brethren. These came around in the Middle English period, actually, when there was a rekindled fashion for sticking nasal N sounds at the end of things to pluralise them. It's actually kind of stupid, because these words were already pluralised forms before the N was added. Childer was a plural of child. They didn't need that N on the end. And brother was an umlaut plural of brother. But they stuck that N on the end anyway. And we still use those versions today, even though we have brothers as well, obviously. And actually, cistern was also once an option. It was used by Chaucer in the 1300s in the Canterbury Tales and stayed with us until the 16th century. But now it's long gone. 
Now there are actually an awful lot of these Middle English N plurals that have been displaced by S versions instead. For example, when Shakespeare was around, some people were saying shoon instead of shoes, hausen instead of houses, and toon instead of toes. So there you go, all of these things are a relic of a thousand years of English language history. The next category of plurals I want to look at is the ones that stay the same. Now there are more of these than you might initially think. If you catch one fish or a whole net of fish, they are still just called fish, aren't they? If you have one sheep or a thousand sheep, the word is still sheep. Or you can have one deer or many deer or one moose or many moose. And there are actually loads of others. Well, this phenomenon is also down to Old English. You see, Old English used to have three grammatical genders, like modern day German does, masculine, feminine, and neuter. It's something I explained fully in one of my other videos. It's well worth a watch after this one, though, maybe. Now, did you notice anything about all of the weird plural, non-plurals that I just listed? They were all animals. Now, in Old English, animals were more often than not neuter, and Old English change the way it pluralized nouns depending on their grammatical gender. And for neuter, that involved not changing the word at all. Neuter plurals were often just exactly the same as the singular form. And that practice of keeping them the same has stuck with us to this day. Right, uh, the next category of weird plurals I'm calling knives, halves, lives and wives. Now, for native speakers of English, the swapping of an F for a V when pluralizing certain words is just second nature. It seems so natural that we sometimes do it when we're not supposed to. Did you know that it's actually roofs, not roofs? But if you think about it, it's actually really weird. We don't normally swap consonants willy-nilly when turning the one into the many. So why do we do it with knife and knives, or hoof and hooves, wolf and wolves, wife and wives? Well, one of the theories for this is just that the fs sound, that fs, is just kind of awkward. It's common that, you know, any combination of letters that's even mildly tricky to say gets softened or phased out, particularly in English over the years. But, I mean, we don't have a problem with it when we say words like proofs, or if he fluffs it up, or she wolfs it down, or the big bad wolf huffs and puffs. And that FS sound also appears elsewhere, even if it's spelt differently. Think of the word troughs. So I don't really buy that idea. So what could be another reason behind the F and V switcheroo? Well, there is one, and it's a very satisfying one to my mind. So it requires us once again to return to our ancestral language, Old English. Now in Old English, an F was pronounced how we pronounce it now, if it was at the start or the end of a word, such as uh, fader, meaning father, or wif, meaning woman. But when it came in the middle of a word, specifically between two vowels, or after a voiced consonant, of which L is one, something amazing happened. It was pronounced like a V. The Old English for the number seven is siovan. The Old English for wolf is wolf, but wolves is wolvas. You see how it's pronounced with a V sound despite it being an F? Now over time, that V sound got transcribed as a V and left us with the spellings of those plurals like wives, knives and wolves that we have today. I told you it was quite a satisfying one, didn't I? Now the next set of plurals we use in English but don't follow the conventional English formula are plurals that we've simply pilfered from Latin and Greek. These include words that end with um, which we pluralize with an a, for example, such as stadium, which becomes stadia, or referendum, which becomes referenda. Although, in almost all of these cases, it is acceptable, even preferable in everyday speech, to use a regular English plural by slamming an s on the end. We can talk about stadiums and referendums, and it's much better to talk about minimums than minima, right? And actually, an extra side note, for a few of these, uh, we've largely lost one of the forms or confused the plural for the singular. I've never heard anyone really talk about a single item on an agenda as an agendum. They call it an item on an agenda. And it's really rare to hear anyone making a calculation based on a single datum. We'd just call it a point of data, wouldn't we? In fact, we often use the word data 
as if it's a singular, let me show you this data, we'd say, which actually sounds less weird than let me show you these data, although you will occasionally hear people say that. Another set of Latin nouns that we pluralize weirdly are those ending with us, with us, which we pluralize by slamming an I on the end in this case. So we've got cactus, focus, and radius become cacti, foci, and radii, even though I think the standard English focuses sounds a lot less poncy than foci. And let's not even get started on another word, octopuses. Okay, let's get started on it. It's not octopi, it's octopodes. Its origins are actually Greek, not Latin. Good that we've nipped that one in the bud. Speaking of Greek, by the way, plurals to watch out for are the likes of crisis and axis, which are crises and axes. They come from Greek. There are also those ending with on that pluralize with an a, such as criterion and phenomenon, all from ancient Greek. And finally, we have those sexy x words like vortex, index, and matrix, which become vortices, indices, and matrices. So that's your Latin and your Greek. On to our final set of unusual English plurals, the ones where we just got confused. I want to give a last shout out to the handful of words we've taken from other languages, mostly from Italian, it has to be said, and made a complete mess of their plurals. A round of applause, please, for our use of panini to mean a single toasted sandwich. So that's actually the Italian plural noun, a single sandwich is a panino. Watch out also when eating biscotti for the same reason. And uh, we also talk about graffiti as if it's singular, but in Italian, graffiti are plural acts of vandalism or art, depending on your point of view. Oh, and the same goes for those tasty Polish treats, pierogi. Don't listen to anyone who tells you they're having pierogies. And there we go. A thousand thanks to you for staying to the end of this video. If you have enjoyed it, please do hit the like and subscribe buttons. And if I've missed anything during this, for example, your favorite weird plural, then pop it in the comments and tell me all about it. Next, why not check out my video about English and uh, when it used to have those three grammatical genders. Until next time, you take care.